Welcome, everyone. I am so excited to talk to Dr. Sam Kashani today. He is a board-certified sleep medicine physician, and we are going to be talking all about parasomnias. So if you're a primary care doctor, a psychiatrist, a therapist, or another type of healthcare practitioner, this is your parasomnia class 101, because it's one of those sleep disorders that you're likely seeing in your practice, but you may not be realizing it, right? So it's really important that we have this on our radar and we know what to look out for. If you are a clinician, a physician, or other type of healthcare practitioner, then go ahead and subscribe to this channel. This is all about clinical sleep medicine for you as the practitioner. If we haven't met before, I'm Dr. Nishi Bhopal. I am an integrative psychiatrist and sleep medicine physician. And one more thing before we jump in is that many of our patients are taking melatonin. So I have a free melatonin brand guide for clinicians because quality matters. There was a study in JAMA, and then another one in the Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine talking about melatonin quality. So I've put together a brand guide for you as the practitioner that you can use in your practice. You can get that at intrabalance.com forward slash melatonin, and I'll put the link in the description underneath. Okay, so let's get started. Dr. Sam, thank you so much for joining me today. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about your background? Sure. Thank you so much for having me. So I'm Sam Kashani. I'm a sleep medicine physician. I practice at UCLA Health here in Los Angeles, California. I trained in sleep medicine here at UCLA as well. I practice exclusively sleep medicine. I see patients of all ages, adult pediatric for all sleep-related issues. I'm also incoming president of the California Sleep Society, and I love talking about sleep. So... <laughs> Great. No, that's amazing. And your primary specialty, was it internal medicine and pulmonary or... I actually, you know, it's interesting. I did my residency in family medicine and I was planning on doing primary care. I had no plans to pursue sleep medicine at all when I was a resident or training at any point. In fact, it was during my electives in my second or third year of residency that I wanted to pick an easy elective to just kind of sail through. And so I thought, hey, sleep sounds pretty chill. And then once I started it, you know, prior to that, my only knowledge of sleep medicine was really limited to just sleep apnea and CPAP devices and whatnot. And I think that's kind of all I thought sleep medicine was at the time. But once I started and I saw that there's a lot in sleep medicine and there's a whole world of sleep disorders that extend far beyond breathing issues, that's when I started to fall in love with sleep. And then I decided to pursue my fellowship in sleep. And here I am. Yeah, it's it's always so interesting to hear how people got into sleep medicine. And when I started, I, I didn't know, like when I started residency, I didn't know sleep medicine was a thing. I didn't know it was a fellowship. And yeah. I heard about it from a senior resident of mine who was going into sleep. And I was like, oh, that sounds really interesting. What's that about? It was kind of an accidental thing that I stumbled into. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about it. <laughs> the awareness, right? It's the awareness. Yeah. And, you know, one of the reasons I started this online platform teaching physicians is because one, there's so few sleep doctors. So that's why, you know, I love to showcase doctors like yourself because there just aren't enough sleep doctors out there. So it's important that we sort of, you know, spread this knowledge. But the other reason is that most physicians only get one or two hours of sleep education in medical training. And most of it is focused on either sleep disorder, breathing or insomnia. But there's this whole world of other sleep disorders like parasomnias, which we are going to talk about today. Absolutely. Great. So can you tell us just, you know, the basics of like, what is a parasomnia? What are we even talking about? Yeah. So when we use the term parasomnia, essentially we're referring to a subcategory of sleep disorders that are characterized by complex and abnormal movements and behaviors during sleep. When we assess parasomnias clinically, we pretty much typically divide them into whether they are parasomnias occurring during rapid eye movement sleep or parasomnias of REM sleep uh, versus parasomnias of non-rapid eye movement sleep or non-REM sleep. And there are a lot of parasomnias, and there are parasomnias that are more common in the pediatric population and very often benign. And then there are more serious parasomnias that can result or that have serious implications for the future. Uh, as well as things like bedroom safety or patient safety, which is one thing that we're definitely concerned about in the, in the case of most parasomnia, is people potentially hurting or injuring themselves during sleep as a result of these movements and behaviors. Yeah, and I think, and I like how you sort of broke that down into, you know, there's benign parasomnias, and then there's ones that are more serious and could be a sign of, you know, other issues that could be, you know, could develop downstream. And often patients, I find this with patients is that, they don't realize that these movements or these behaviors during sleep are problematic. 
And so it is something that we as the physicians should be asking about. So maybe we can start with just, could you share some examples of parasomnia? So what are the more benign ones? And what are the ones that, you know, could indicate other issues down the line? Yeah. So starting with parasomnias of non-REM sleep, so common ones that we think of sleepwalking or somnambulism, that's considered a parasomnia of non-REM sleep. Very often in the pediatric population, sleepwalking is often harmless. Kids are less likely to hurt themselves. They're also less likely to have daytime problems or daytime issues as a result of sleepwalking. And very often they will just sort of outgrow it as a result of just growing. And part of the reason that it happens to in the pediatric population so often, whether it's somnambulism or sleep terrors, which I can talk about in a moment, is because the brain of the child is changing. So as the brain of the child is changing and developing, it's trying to figure out how to take this initial 16-hour sleep requirement that we're born with in infancy that is divided into two stages of sleep, non-REM and REM, and sort of cut that down and create transitions between these new stages to what will become ultimately our final four stages of adult sleep. So that evolution process in the pediatric person or patient is part of the reason that these parasomnias develop and, and arise. Technically, it's kind of, you can look at it like sort of it's a sleep, a, a fate of sleep state instability that is allowing for these, these complex movements and behaviors to occur. And there are very often triggers, things like fever, illness, certain medications can do it, or just sleep irregularities, circadian dysregulation, or catching up on sleep deprivation. For example, there's a number of things that can provoke parasomnia behavior. So those are examples of more benign ones in the pediatric population, somnambulism and sleep terrors. And I think it's important to really define what a sleep terror is because we all know what it is to sleepwalk. Uh, but a sleep terror is a distinct entity in a sense that it's not just somebody who has really bad dreams at nighttime and then wakes up screaming. That's a nightmare. Whereas a sleep terror really, first of all, has nothing to do with dreams because in non-REM sleep, we don't really dream. So for that reason, when we're talking about sleepwalking or sleep terrors or other parasomnias of non-REM sleep, there really is no dream component associated with these movements or behaviors. These people are essentially engaging in these automatisms or automatic behaviors independent of any kind of dream. So, and then sleep terrors really refers more to the, let's say, child in, one, in, in the case of a sleep terror who suddenly rises from sleep, hysterical, sobbing, screaming. Many of us have a joke in sleep medicine and say that sleep terrors only cause terror to the parents because the child really doesn't know what they're doing, as is the case with sleepwalking. So those are, like we said, kind of more your more common pediatric parasomnias more common that are more commonly benign and, and don't result in injurious behaviors or episodes. And then we have the parasomnias of REM sleep, which there's a few of them. The most concerning one and the one that we see a lot more commonly in adults is what's called REM sleep behavior disorder, also known as RBD. And REM sleep behavior disorder, I would say, is probably the most para concerning parasomnia of all for a few reasons. Number one, uh, the chance of injury during sleep as a result of dream enactment behavior, which is the cardinal feature of REM sleep behavior disorder, where essentially a person is enacting what they're doing in their dream. So, for example, they'll be having a nightmare or a dream. They're punching somebody in their dream or they're yelling and they actually physically start doing that, whether it's vocalizing while they're in bed or swinging their arms and accidentally punching their bed partner, which happens very frequently in this setting. These are the things that we're most concerned about immediately, at least with REM sleep behavior disorder, is potential injury to the person or to their partner. I've had plenty of patients that fall out of bed as a result of dream enactment behavior, that fracture their fingers as a result of punching the nightstand. I even had one patient that actually reached for their gun that was in their nightstand while they were having a dream that they were in the middle of a gunfight. This was actually a vet. And it's important to note that it can be seen with a little bit of a higher prevalence in the vet population. But even in addition to that concern for potential injury is that a lot of people with REM sleep behavior disorder, not all of them, but a lot of them are at a higher risk of developing a neurodegenerative disorder later in life and specifically alpha synucleinopathies like Parkinson's disease dementia with Lewy bodies, or multiple system atrophy. So something that might seem as, as, as simple or as non-concerning as somebody just swinging their arms at night and acting their dreams out could have implications for them developing one of these neurodegenerative conditions later in life. So it becomes a really sensitive and serious conversation when patients present with that kind of behavior. There are a few other parasomnias. There are, there's what we call nightmare disorder which essentially refers to somebody who has a lot of disruptive nightmares and they're causing them distress. They're disruptive to sleep and causing distress during the daytime. So that's nightmare disorder. 
There's also recurrent isolated sleep paralysis, where a person just has isolated sleep paralysis happening frequently, whether it's as they're falling asleep or as they're just waking up from sleep. But those are, in terms of REM parasomnias, it's really RBD that we're most concerned about. Great. That's really helpful and an excellent kind of overview of, of these different parasomnias to be looking out for. So for the non-sleep doctor, you know, the primary care doctor or the psychiatrist out there who's working with patients, what should they be asking? Because, you know, as we were discussing, sometimes patients won't bring these concerns into the clinical visit because it just may not be something that they're that they think is even a concern, or they may not even realize they're doing some of these things, especially if they live alone. So what should we be asking as the clinicians? Yeah, great question. And and so important because not only do not a lot of people not realize it, but a lot of people might think it's funny or just think that it's something to talk about at dinner parties. You know, my husband punches the air when he's asleep or, you know, my wife sleepwalks or something like that. But usually in adults, REM sleep behavior disorder is always concerning, obviously, for the reasons that we just said. But even sleepwalking, as simple and straightforward and benign and, you know, familiar as that might seem to a lot of people, because everybody has some familiarity with sleepwalking, whether it's because they know someone that sleepwalked or they sleepwalked as a child or they've watched television or TikTok nowadays. But with that said, even sleepwalking can be really concerning in the case of an adult. And typically, it's not normal for an adult to sleepwalk. Usually, there's a reason that an adult is sleepwalking, and they can also potentially harm themselves, unlike children. So all that to say that I think that important questions to bring up during a clinical interview to kind of you know address these types of things, first of all, very often, these people have a bed partners. Now, when they have a bed partner, that's obviously super helpful because the bed partner will report to them exactly what they see. And from there, you can kind of start deducing whether this is more likely a parasomnia of non-REM sleep, whether it's a parasomnia of REM sleep. And in the differential for some parasomnia behaviors at nighttime, seizure disorders is something to also consider because very often you may have somebody who might look like they're sleepwalking or having complex motor behaviors during sleep, but really, in fact, they're having seizures. So getting an idea of not only the movements and the behaviors and their characteristics at nighttime, whether it's walking, stereotypically moving the extremities, or yelling and shouting out in clear language that the person's able to recall content of a dream the next day, starting with that, and then looking at the timing. Because typically what happens is most of our REM sleep, it takes about 90 minutes from the time that we fall asleep before we hit our first cycle of rapid eye movement sleep. But then all throughout the night, as we're cycling through the stages all throughout the nighttime sleep, most of our REM sleep actually kind of clusters and condenses in the second half of the night. So if we're thinking that this person that I'm seeing right now is describing to me what could potentially be dream enactment behavior, asking them what time does it typically occur? If they'd say that, oh, you know what, it's usually always in those deep early morning hours in the last few hours of sleep or the last few hours before I wake up, or the partner will say that, you know, last night it occurred at 4 a.m. and last, you know, a week ago it occurred at about 2.30 a.m. So just by knowing the timing, you can kind of deduce whether that fits more during REM sleep versus non-REM sleep. Whereas non-REM parasomnia is more often the sleepwalking, the sleep terrors, sleep eating, sexomnia, all of these being examples of non-REM parasomnias are more likely to occur in the first part of the nighttime. And then in addition to the timing and the characteristic of the movements and behaviors, also kind of getting an idea of how often is this occurring, not only in terms of frequency of nights per week, but how about in one night? Are there multiple episodes? Because sleepwalking, for example, is usually something that there are not multiple episodes in one night. Whereas with seizures during sleep, you're very often likely to see multiple episodes back to back throughout the nighttime. And similarly, uh, unlike with sleepwalking, especially in pediatric patients, uh, people who are having seizures during sleep, pediatric or adult, are more likely to have daytime symptoms, things like unrefreshing sleep, or maybe a little bit of brain fog, or just being tired, sleepy, or fatigued during the daytime on nights where they're particularly active. So all of these things can kind of help clue you into whether the behavior is occurring during REM sleep or non-REM sleep, whether the behavior looks coordinated and purposeful, right? Because a lot of times dream enactment behavior doesn't necessarily need to be violent punching. It can be, for example, somebody dreaming of catching a football. And if you see that they're kind of, you know, extending their arm or raising their arm in this sort of complex or purposeful or coordinated way, then that might also suggest more dream enactment behavior as opposed to just aimlessly swinging the extremities during sleep. So it's really all of these things that I think are really important in factoring in. And like we said, or like you mentioned, a lot of people don't necessarily volunteer this information or bring it up. 
But usually the first question that I bring up is, has anybody ever observed you or has your partner ever told you that you exhibit any strange movements, bizarre movements, bizarre behaviors, excessive movements, vigorous flailing of the upper or lower extremities, yelling or shouting? Because sleep talking is definitely not a parasomnia. Sleep talking is not a sleep disorder. Sleep talking is totally benign. But yelling or shouting during sleep, also particularly happening in the second half of the nighttime, that's not that may not represent just sleep talking. It might represent vocal dream enactment behavior in the case of somebody who's yelling in their dream or nightmare and then actually yelling. So again, just getting an idea of the behaviors, whether there's dream recall that can be attached or connected to the movements and behaviors, and also, like we said, frequency and daytime symptoms. Excellent. Yeah, that's really helpful. And yeah, just asking the question of, you know, has anyone ever noticed that you do anything strange in your sleep? Like kicking, punching, flailing, screaming. And, you know, I'm all about efficiency as well. So something that I recommend to physicians is to just put that question in your screening paperwork, right? Because you might not have time, especially if you're not seeing the patient for a sleep issue, you might be seeing them for hypertension or depression or, or something else. And you may not have time in, in a short visit to go into all of these things. And so you can streamline by putting some of these questions into paperwork that the patient fills out before their visit. And sleep is a vulnerable thing, right? So sometimes I'll find that patients, especially for me as a psychiatrist, if they're not seeing me specifically for sleep, sometimes people... It, it's a little uncomfortable for them to talk about this stuff. So you might not get the information immediately upon asking, right? They might go back and think about it and then come back to you in the next visit and say, well, actually, doctor, I was thinking about what you asked me. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, definitely. I think that, you know, a lot of people going back to your previous question about how do you know, or how do you get this information out of people in the case of somebody who doesn't have a bed partner now, obviously it's going to be more challenging, but even in that setting, very often there are often indicators or clues that there was a lot of movement or a lot of activity in the bed the night before. In the case of, for example, dream enactment behavior, very often these people, even if they're sleeping alone, they might awaken to their bed sheets being in total disarray or feeling, you know, like you know, they find pillows or, you know, random things that maybe they had on their bed all over the room or on the floors. Uh, additionally, with sleep-related eating disorder, which is a parasomnia of non-REM sleep and can very often be associated with uh, medication as a side effect, specifically Zolpidem or what's commonly sold as Ambien. Very often, these people might find Doritos bags in their bed that they don't know how they got there, or they might get to the kitchen and find that there's ice cream sitting on the counter melting or some kind of clues or indicators that uh, something happened last night or that there was something odd last night. In fact, I always bring up this example during uh, other talks about the episode of House. I'm not sure if you saw it, but there's a very famous episode of House where there's a person who keeps getting pregnant and keeps having uh, miscarriages and doesn't know exactly how they got pregnant to begin with because they reported not being sexually active when they were evaluated. And then by the end of the episode, of course, House just discovers everything because he just knows everything, determines that the person was actually sleepwalking into their next door neighbor's apartment and engaging in sexual behavior during sleep, which is considered, which, which is what we call sexomnia, also considered parasomnia, non-REM sleep, and was essentially getting pregnant without being aware of it at all. And again, because it's occurring during non-REM sleep, there's no dream association with it, and there's typically no recall. Now, however, with that said, there are adult sleepwalkers who might be able to kind of recall certain moments during a sleepwalking episode, because the way to really think about a lot of these parasomnias is that it's not so much that the behavior is occurring during through sleep, but sort of like what you can think of as this sort of state of arousal that exists between sleep and wake. It's a very kind of unique and abstract way of thinking about it. Essentially, they might actually have some recall and they might remember, for example, that, you know, at some point at the nighttime, I remember I was in the bathroom staring at the shower for no reason. Or I was in my closet, you know, looking at this one particular shirt. I, I think I just have this vague memory that I did that. So. They may have some recall, but generally there's usually no recall associated with those episodes. Very, very helpful again. And yeah, looking for those clues and, you know, and I just wanted to emphasize again that these are serious conditions and people can have, you know, there can be serious repercussions, even with, you know, Zolpidem or Ambien, there's been cases of sleep driving, people getting into their car and, and, and driving yeah. and getting into accidents. I'm thinking about, so I grew up in Canada 
And there was a, a TV show called Stephen and Chris. So if anyone is from Canada and you remember that show, let me know in the comments. But Stephen and Chris hosted like a morning lifestyle show. They talk about fashion and food and all kinds of things. And they were kind of a beloved, you know, you know, there were a couple and they had this this show. Anyway, the sad thing is, is that Chris, he died from sleepwalking. He sleepwalked off their balcony and he fell and, and he died. And this was a number of years ago, probably like, you know, 15, 20 years ago or something. I might be getting the dates wrong, but I just, I, I always think about that. And gosh, what if he had seen a sleep doctor? What if he had gotten that evaluated and, and treated, you know? So like, yeah. So I just wanted to highlight that these are serious conditions that we really need to be evaluating for. Absolutely. Absolutely. Such an important point. I can't tell you the number of patients that I've had that whether it was REM sleep behavior disorder or sleepwalking that have injured themselves, injured their partners, uh, put themselves at risk for really serious issues like you said, sleep driving. I, I have had somebody who actually sleep drove and drove right into a pole. Thankfully, that person is okay. But I mean, you can imagine that obviously a situation like that can be a lot worse. And you pointed out a good example there. There's also a very famous comedian named Matt Berbiglia or Mike Berbiglia, sorry. He wrote a book, actually, it's great. It's called Sleepwalk With Me. And he also made a film based on that book and essentially talking about how he developed REM sleep behavior disorder, what he went through before he was even able to get the correct diagnosis and sort of some episodes of dream enactment behavior, which he depicts really nicely in his movie. He'll show, you know, all of a sudden a scene will start in a dream. And then next thing you know, he'll be standing on top of his dresser and falling off and hitting the floor. So, and I do believe he had one episode, actually, this is not a good movie, but he even had an episode where he was in a hotel room and jumped out of a window as a result of having a dream. Now, one thing to keep in mind about REM sleep behavior disorder is that more often in the majority of cases, the behaviors and movements are usually confined to the bed itself, meaning that exiting the bed or sleepwalking is not something that you see as often in association with REM sleep behavior disorder. However, there are those patients who have little bits of both who have maybe parasomnia behavior of non-REM sleep in addition to REM sleep. Like I have one person who has REM sleep behavior disorder diagnosed, confirmed on a sleep study, which in fact is the only parasomnia that a sleep study is required to make the diagnosis. All other sleep studies, or excuse me, all other parasomnias are diagnosed clinically. Um, but this person in particular has very violent dream enactment behavior and also happens to sleepwalk. So a lot more concerning in that case, whether they're in bed or they're up and around, he's at risk, that person is at risk for serious injury. So usually in situations like that, you have to use pharmacotherapy in addition to other behavioral measures to really just reduce the risk of potential injury or something bad happening. Along the lines of workup and treatment, should the primary care physician, the psychiatrist, or whoever's working with the patient, you know, if they're a physician, should they start the treatment? What kind of workup should they be doing? Or should they just go ahead and refer to sleep medicine first? What would you recommend? Yeah, great question. Uh, personally, I'm of the belief that having a low threshold to refer to sleep medicine is, is a good thing, just because sleep disorders are not always as straightforward as they may seem. In fact, they're usually not in my experience. Um, but, you know, having a specialist on board to really do a full evaluation and check for other sleep related comorbidities, uh, which is going to all matter when it comes to management is a good thing, I think. However, I do think that it's totally viable for a non sleep physician to manage these as well. I think that as is the case with any kind of clinical chief complaint, the first question is if somebody's presenting with, for example, sleepwalking, why are they sleepwalking? What's causing it? Um, like we said earlier, there are various triggers that can precipitate sleepwalking or parasomnia behavior. Uh, for example, drugs, alcohol, certain medications, certain sleep disorders may underlie something like sleepwalking. For example, sleep apnea. Untreated sleep apnea, just because it's such a problem child, if you will, to sleep in terms of just being disruptive to the structural integrity of sleep and causing arousals and fragmentation of the nighttime sleep all throughout the night. It creates such an unstable sleep that through unstable sleep, a lot of parasomnia behaviors can be provoked. So very often you might have somebody who actually has sleep apnea, may not know it at all or may not necessarily feel it per se, um, but they're presenting with sleepwalking. And if that person, for example, has risk factors for sleep apnea or anything in their clinical history that may suggest sleep disordered breathing as a possibility, then doing a full workup for that, addressing it, treating it, very often that alone will treat the parasomnia or stabilize the parasomnia because in, in the case, in the specific case of sleep apnea, there are quite a few parasomnias that can be secondary to that, including sleepwalking, including REM sleep behavior disorder. 
In fact, when somebody has untreated sleep apnea and presents with dream enactment behavior, and you determine that person has sleep apnea and you treat their sleep apnea, if their dream enactment behavior resolves with treatment of the sleep apnea, we call that pseudo REM sleep behavior disorder or pseudo RBD due to untreated sleep apnea. Whereas true RBD or what's called isolated or IRBD would be independent of untreated sleep apnea or would be present whether the person's sleep apnea was treated. So all that to say that really just kind of first starting with what could potentially be the cause of the parasomnia behavior, whether it's any one of those common triggers, and then determining if there might be another sleep comorbidity like sleep apnea, or for example, restless leg syndrome, one of the most underestimated, I think, sleep disorders that can not only be a nuisance and, and disruptive to the patient subjectively, but very often restless leg syndrome can be per the trigger that precipitates a lot of parasomnia behavior, especially sleepwalking. What happens very often in people with restless leg, and, and not everybody, of course, but many people who have restless leg all throughout the nighttime, once they have fallen asleep, because of course, restless leg is something that happens during wakefulness when you're still in bed and haven't fallen asleep yet and you feel that annoying feeling that you have to move your legs around. Very often, and a lot of people who have RLS, once they actually do fall asleep, very often they continue to move their legs throughout the nighttime. And we call those periodic limb movements of sleep or PLMs. And somebody having a lot of PLMs throughout the nighttime, causing kind of bits of arousal and, and, and disruption and fragmentation to the nighttime sleep, that can precipitate sleepwalking and parasomnia behavior. So I think that those are really the first two most important things to evaluate is trying to determine whether there is an overt or obvious cause or trigger for the behavior, as well as the possibility of any kind of underlying sleep-related pathology that might be creating unstable sleep to allow for parasomnia behavior to come out. So helpful. And yeah, and I totally agree with having a low threshold to refer to sleep medicine. And now with telehealth, there's there, you know, there's more online sleep clinics available and, you know, people can see their sleep physician through a telehealth visit. So it's much more accessible than it used to be. So really having a low threshold and just to highlight again, what you were saying about sleep disruptions, so we want to look at essentially part of the treatment is gluing sleep back together. Right. And so like, you know, we've got this fragmented sleep and then it can, you know, house these sort of parasomnias. And so if we can stitch that at my fellowship director used to call it like the sleep glue, we just need a sleep glue to you know glue the sleep back together. And if we can restore that sleep architecture, you know, that can have a really positive impact and even just, you know, regular sleep schedules and minimizing circadian dysregulation. Like I remember when I was, you know, in residency doing, you know, calls, having episodes of sleep paralysis because of the sleep deprivation and circadian dysreg dysregulation. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> totally hear you. Absolutely. <laughs> My dog is agreeing here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. So this has been a, a masterclass really on parasomnias. And I think we could go on, but, you know, maybe we'll have to do another session on, you know, more detailed treatment and assessment. But I think this sort of provides a really good overview for the clinician on just, you know, things to look for and, and just an understanding of parasomnias. What um, is a clinical tip that you would like to share with our listeners for today? A clinical tip, I guess, kind of related to parasomnias uh, indirectly. I think that what's really important in evaluating patients for sleep issues and sleep disorders is really gauging daytime issues. Just because not everybody with sleep disorders is going to is going to complain of daytime issues, but most people will. And I think that really kind of trying to really clearly assess what daytime symptoms they might be experiencing, because daytime sleepiness is not the only symptom associated with disrupted nighttime sleep. There's brain fog, there is non-restorative sleep or waking up with really profound or prolonged sleep inertia, having, you know, needing naps regardless of nocturnal sleep duration. I think that really assessing the daytime is such an important thing. And the way to do that is it can be challenging. It's it's not always straightforward because somebody may not necessarily endorse sleepiness or report sleepiness. Even somebody who sleeps three or four hours a night, which we know many people like this, may not feel sleepy at all because sleepiness is a completely subjective and, and perceptive thing. And every brain and body feels it differently. So in really asking questions from patients and trying to elicit it, trying to elicit symptoms during the daytime, I think it's important to kind of just be specific in your approach and not necessarily just kind of ask, are you sleepy or are you not? But more so things like, for example, when you're sedentary and you're sitting inactively, you know, after a big meal at lunchtime and you're sitting on your couch, 
or when you're sitting in front of your computer for you know long prolonged periods of time or you're sitting in the car as a passenger for a long ride or you're at a red light for a long time situations in which you're not totally engaged and actively focused on something do you feel like you could potentially lapse into a tired sleepy or drowsy state not necessarily inadvertently pass out which I know that our, for example, Epworth sleepiness scale questionnaire that we give to a lot of patients to assess daytime sleepiness or the difficulty with maintaining wakefulness, it's it can be a helpful tool, but at the same time, the way that it's written is such that it makes it sound kind of like a person has no control over whether they just fall asleep or not. And sleepy patients, even the sleepiest people with syndromes of hypersomnolence like narcolepsy or idiopathic hypersomnia may not have that issue of uncontrollably falling asleep. So I think that, again, it's the way that you ask these questions, not necessarily, are you sleepy or do you fall asleep when you're not stimulated and just pass out inadvertently, but rather, do you feel like in those moments when you're sedentary and inactive that you can lapse into a drowsy or tired state or potentially excuse yourself and take a nap if you wanted to type of kind of way of asking it as opposed to, are you sleepy? So I think daytime symptoms are very important to ask when it comes to assessing sleep issues. So good. Yeah, that's so good. And, and it really emphasizes the nuance when it comes to sleepiness, because like you said, it doesn't always look like people having sleep attacks or, you know, uncontrollably yawning. It can look like depression. It can look like low motivation, brain fog, like you said, irritability, all kinds of symptoms. You know, sleep is so fundamental and there's such an overlap with, you know, sleep and mental health issues and all these other things. So we'll save that conversation for another time. But for you, I'm curious for you as a busy physician, you know, thank you for taking time out of your work day today, you know, to, to teach us about parasomnias. How do you take care of your own sleep? <laughs> Well, like you said, sleep is very fragile, and it's really all of our responsibilities to ensure that we protect our sleep on a night-to-night -night basis because it is vulnerable to all kinds of internal disturbances and, and different things. So I try to practice really good sleep hygiene, and I think more, more important than sleep hygiene, uh, I think something that we're all guilty of not always doing is giving our body the sleep that it requires. A lot of people always ask me, what's the most important good sleep habit to have? And I say to sleep because your body needs it, your body wants it. And because we live in a modern time where we don't always necessarily listen to that urge from our body. And we like to also burn the candle at both ends and push ourselves to stay up later and then curtail the end of our sleep period in the morning and wake up earlier to get the day started. So I think that the most important sleep habit is for us to sleep when our body needs it. Excellent. Yeah, really to make it a priority. So again, thank you so much. If people want to learn more about you, where can they find you? You can find me on Instagram as well as LinkedIn. You can just do a search for Sam Kashani MD and you'll see me there. Okay, wonderful. So I'll put the links to your Instagram and LinkedIn in the video description below so people can, can come and follow Dr. Kashani and learn more. And for any clinicians who are watching this video, please let me know in the comments, what were your biggest takeaways from this conversation and how might it change your clinical practice? So thank you again, Dr. Kashani, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And yeah, you have a great day. Thank you. You too. Thanks a lot.